Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the College Hoops Daily Podcast. My name is Zach Kroll. I am your host, and I am so happy to be back with you guys talking about my favorite sport, college basketball, and the season. It's not too far away, and you know when the season gets close, we're going to be talking about it here on this show. And we're going to be starting off this new season here on the College Hoops Daily Podcast talking about some conference previews. And today, the conference we're going to be focusing on is the Big East. And it's crazy because last year, really within the last couple of years, but I would say the last two years in particular, since uh, UConn got uh, added back into the league, it felt like this Big East conference, it has kind of been reborn for the first time really since the realignment when the Big East lost Syracuse and they lost Louisville and they lost UConn for the first time. It really feels great to have the Big East Conference back on the biggest stage of the sport. And that was on full display last year when the UConn Huskies, they won the national championship. They beat San Diego State in Houston. And that was just a great, great thing to see Dan Hurley and that program getting back to where they belong on the biggest stage. And that should continue heading into this season. It's crazy also because the AP poll, uh, the first uh version of the AP top 25 it just dropped about an hour ago and already there is some controversy within the Big East teams in that poll and who is the highest ranked team we're going to get into that and everything else with this conference in just a little bit but I'm not going to be doing it alone since we're going to be talking UConn and the rest of this conference there's no better person to be bringing on to this episode today than our guy Aaron Torres he of course a UConn alum a UConn fan, and I'm really looking forward to getting uh, his perspective on his team and the rest of the Big East. AT, thank you so much for joining me. What's going on? ZK, what's up, man? It's good to be back. Uh, By the way, for anybody watching on YouTube, yes, you are on my YouTube channel. We do a ton of College Hoops content here as well. Zach works with me, uh, hosts the College Hoops Daily, which you can get pretty much anywhere, Apple, Spotify, et cetera. So if you love College Hoops, make sure to be checking out the podcast. I'll be helping them with some preseason stuff and then once the season begins, uh, he'll be doing the show three, four times a week, whatever it ends up being. By the way, we'll be doing some episodes without me in the preseason as well. But Zach, uh, as you said, man, season's coming. I'm glad to be back with you. I'm glad to be talking about this sport. And it does feel like every day there's some new piece of information coming out, whether it's a top 25, whether it's a practice report, whatever. Uh, and it is great to have this sport back, uh, you know, kind of in the mainstream. Absolutely. And I know we've been talking about this a little bit throughout the offseason, but I really feel like in this offseason in particular, it really hit me like the transfer portal. We know how important it is. And if you just ignore it, like you're not going to be successful in today's version of the sport. But it definitely helps people like us who love talking about the sport. And sometimes people like us who say, man, the offseason, it just can't uh, go by any slower. But with all of the transfer news, with uh, all of the coaching changes as well. I just feel like I know you have the famous line, like college basketball all of a sudden is a 12 month a year sport. And uh, I just love that and talking about it. No, it's funny because I'll say in a lot of ways, it's made our lives easier because you're looking at rosters um, into, you know, and I say this all the time, but it used to be season that would end in March. You'd have like a five star that was maybe not, had not committed and that was the big news. And then you kind of just didn't really talk about it and un- talk about the sport until, um, you know, a little bit around the NBA draft. But then you would obviously wouldn't really talk about it till October, November. Now you're just looking at roster stuff is moving. Stuff is changing all the way into June, sometimes in some cases into July. I mean, we're going to talk about UConn in a minute. I believe Cam Spencer committed like very, very late May, potentially early June. So it just shows you how late the cycle is going. Um, and it gives us something to talk about. It helps, it helps, um, you know, the, the process of kind of figuring out teams as well. Uh, and yeah, it does feel like it is a 12 month a year sport right now. Uh, but as you said, though, the big East, um, it's a couple of years where there was Nova and a big gap. Now it feels like there's five, six, seven teams that are all really good. And I'm excited to talk about this league. Absolutely. And let's get into it. And uh, I mentioned this right before we started as well. The AP poll, it's come out and already there's some controversy with the Big East and their very passionate fan bases. The UConn Huskies, the defending national champions, they are the highest ranked Big East team in this AP top 25. They come in at number six. You also uh, have Marquette coming in um, at number five, which is very interesting. So those two teams back to back, and then you have Creighton coming in at number eight. So 
there are right now already three Big East teams in the top 10. And I think that's a pretty accurate representation of just how good this league is going to be this year. I don't really remember a time where the Big East Conference had three top 10 teams since realignment. Uh, You mentioned it, Villanova, for about the first seven, eight years since then, they've been really the team that dominated this league. But all of a sudden, Jay Wright, he's no longer in the picture. And this league, just to start, is very appealing at the top. Yeah, first of all, I think I gave you bad information because before we record, I said, oh, the AP poll come out. UConn's actually ranked ahead of Marquette. So if I said that, then I guess maybe that was my my homerdom coming in. But um, listen, you know, I mean, one, it, it shows the depth of the league. Villanova's in the top 25. St. John's just misses the cut. As far as UConn, let, let me, I'm just, let, let's not beat around the bush. I'll, I'll ask you, UConn, reigning national champs. I'll say this, you know, I kind of, you talk about stuff you forget in the offseason kind of forgot how dominant the run was uh, last season. I saw some quotes from Dan Hurley in the last couple of weeks about we don't have to be as great as we were last year, especially in March. I think that they, they won, I believe, every single out-of-conference game that they played by double digits, which is just an insane, insane, insane thing, 11 in the regular season, and then, of course, uh, the six in the NCAA tournament. I'll just throw it right back to you. Can you – UConn can repeat, right? I'm not being the Homer UConn guy by saying that UConn has the talent to repeat, right? I think it's a very interesting question that I kind of go back and forth on because here's the thing, right? I find it very hard to bet against Dan Hurley right now just based on everything that he's done to help build and improve this program over the course of the last four or five years even. And we forget, it's crazy too, like at this year, this year at this time, we were still having our questions and concerns about if UConn was even able to win under Dan Hurley in the NCAA tournament. They had a couple really poor performances within those. Let first- me let me jump in on that really quick, because I think some people would sit there and say, Zach, what are you talking about? That was a conversation with UConn fans. Now, maybe because I'm not in Connecticut, I'm removed from it. But last year would have been year five for Dan Hurley, um, third straight NCAA tournament. Uh, By the way, you draw Rick Pitino and Iona in round one, but there was real questions about, okay, the first two NCAA tournament bids, that's great. We're happy the program is back on the right trajectory, but UConn is one of those programs like a Kentucky, like a a Kansas. You know, I think Tommy Lloyd is going to be dealing with a little bit of this this year is that when you get to the tournament, it's not about getting to the tournament. It's about winning there. So for people who think Zach's crazy, I'm here to tell you he is not. There was real conversation in the UConn fan base, fair or not, kind of going into last January, February, March, you have that great start to last season, but okay, now it's time to show some stuff in the postseason. Yeah. They couldn't score against New Mexico state. Remember that game very well. Two years ago. Yep. Um, So here's the thing, right? Whether or not they could repeat. So Dan Hurley has built this program back into the absolute monster. Like you could tell it's, it's approaching that ceiling that we know, okay, it's like Jim Calhoun where he got it to. And when it's popping, there aren't many better places to be in college basketball than UConn. And that has translated in recruiting as well. I know uh, Cooper Flagg, the number one high school prospect, like he visited not too long ago. This program is an absolute monster. Now, my only doubt and my only worry to say, okay, maybe this team won't be able to repeat is I do think with them just being ranked in the top 10, we have to remember like losing Jordan Hawkins, Andre Jackson and Adama Sonogo. That is just a lot of production to lose. And I know you bring back Donovan Klingon, you bring back Alex Caraban, you bring in Cam Spencer from Rutgers, who's going to be really good. You bring in Stefan Castle, a very highly touted freshman. But my one question with UConn, is there enough here to replace just how good of players guys like Hawkins, Sonogo, and Jackson were? Because that's what made this team so good last year. Those three guys, they were a special group. And I've just seen it in college basketball so many times, like when you lose a core as special as those guys were, it could be very hard to replace. That, I mean, that's the biggest thing. I don't, I don't even think it's necessarily the production. I think it's the leadership and the locker room stuff. Um, And, and by the way, that's something else Dan Hurley has talked about. I mean, I'm not just using this to just quote all things Dan Hurley, but like he talked a lot about this in the preseason is um, the, the vocal leadership, the guys in the locker room, you know, Andre Jackson committed to UConn, when they were in the AAC coming off multiple losing seasons. So he was really there from the beginning. And I think it's two things is one, can those guys that are back 
uh, Caravan and Klingon. Klingon had, does have a little bit of a foot injury. It sounds like he should be available for week for game one. Excuse me. Still in football mode a little bit as you wear your Jets hat there. Say a week one instead of game one. But uh, Tristan Newton's back. But you know you lose the talent, but but the leadership. Well, those guys that were kind of just. I don't want to say they were long for the ride because they contributed, but just they had a bigger role. Can they now, you know, step into not only the production role, but also the leadership void. And then I think, you know, it's like any successful program. And I think the good thing is you do have guys back like a caravan that that's been there, um, you know, through some of the, you know, struggles, if you will, of, of, of prior to last year. But, you know, I think, I, I think when you have success, it's it's natural that when the guys start coming in after they think that the, you know like they think because they're wearing that UConn uniform that they won that national championship and that and that's not the case you know and that that's something that everybody deals with from Alabama and Georgia football to UConn basketball to other programs in previous years um, and I think that's the big thing because I I do think the talent is there I think the talent is good enough to win another national championship but you have the leadership uh, void from a year ago. And just how do all the puzzle pieces fit? You're asking new guys to do new things. And then again, you have some younger guys that, you know, even as Stefan Castle is talented as he is, you know, he hasn't been, he, he's on all the mock draft boards. He's on all this, he's on all that, but he hasn't been through the, it, it sounds cliche and it sounds like I'm being a college basketball guy, but it, it's different to be that dude that's projected versus actually going through it as a college basketball player, especially on a team with high expectations. So it'll be fun to watch. I think the talent is there, but I do think the points about leadership and roles and all that stuff is, is, you know, that those are all very fair conversations. Yeah. And those are three guys that are going to be playing in the NBA next year. It's crazy. Like Sonogo, he won the most outstanding player of the NCAA tournament and didn't even get drafted. Now I know that's a whole different conversation about, you know, big men in the NBA and how valuable they really are. But for a guy to be that dominant in the NCAA tournament, like it's crazy uh, just how much they lost. Now, looking at the rest of the Big East Conference, and I'm just going here as a transition because my one fear about UConn and where they stand in the Big East is, yes, I agree. I think overall talent level, they're right there with anyone else in this league and they have the potential to be really good again. But when I'm looking at their two biggest threats, you have Marquette, and yeah, you're uh, you were right. There, Marquette is actually ranked number five. UConn ranked number six. In the- I gave you bad info. My bad. N- no worries, no worries. Um, and then you have Creighton ranked at number eight. The interesting thing about those three teams, and when I'm comparing UConn in particular to those two, is Marquette and Creighton both have a lot of that continuity coming back. Marquette brings back Kolick, Cam Jones, and Oso Igadoro, probably their three most productive players from last year. Creighton brings back Ryan Kalkbrunner and Trey Alexander and Baylor Shireman. UConn, on the other hand, loses their best three players, you can make the case, from last year. So is that a concern for you when you're comparing UConn to some of the other top teams in the Big East, the fact that both Creighton and Marquette are bringing back basically their top three players from last year and UConn isn't? You know, the only thing that really – like, if we're talking – you know, regular season championships versus March success. Like I do like that. That's the thing about UConn. That's the thing I think Dan Hurley deserves credit for is he's bringing NBA bodies into that program. And so from the UConn perspective, and I don't want to turn this whole podcast into a UConn thing, but like from a UConn perspective, um, you look at them and it's almost like what happened last year. Marquette was better in the regular season. There was a couple other teams that were better in the regular season. I, I do think that UConn, just because of the size and the length and the athleticism and the skill and the whatever that they can throw at you, they can overwhelm you in a March setting that maybe a Marquette can't. I think Creighton's probably somewhere in the middle because I think Kalkbrenner and Trey Alexander are both definitely NBA players. Um, so, yeah, so I think if we're talking, and, and I think this is always an interesting conversation with college basketball, is, um, you know, who should be like, like who should be picked to win the league versus who probably has the most upside as a team because it's a, a, a quirky sport because some of the best teams are the youngest ones because sometimes young talent develops later in the year. It's always tough to say, but yeah, no, I, I, I think that the continuity is it can't do anything but help. And again, don't mean to turn this all into a UConn podcast, but you can go back to this time last year. I think that was a lot of the reason why UConn got off to such a good start was uh, they actually had a couple injuries in the preseason, but for the most part, you look at their starting lineup, 
Sonogo Hawkins, uh, Andre Jackson, and Alex Caravan, who redshirted the year before. They were all in the program the year before. So it was one of those deals where they kind of hit the ground running where whoever, um, uh, you know, fill in the blank. I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. Duke. Duke's a perfect example. I think Duke won their last 10 games before the NCAA tournament, but it took them a minute to get going. Arkansas never really got right until right around SEC tournament, uh, NCAA tournament play. So I think the continuity at those two schools definitely helps. And then I just think it's a, a you know, choose your preference as, as you talk about where you want to stack these teams. I actually think, you know, listen, I think Marquette should be the favorite coming out off of last year in the tournament, in, in the conference. But as far as who can have tournament success, I think they all bring strengths and weaknesses uh, to this to this season ahead. Yeah, and I definitely think there are reasonable cases to be made for any of those three teams if you want to label them as the favorite to win the league. And I do agree. It's so interesting when you compare UConn and Marquette, especially because I remember coming out of the Big East tournament when Marquette beat UConn in the semifinals. I I remember thinking to myself, like, man, does Marquette just have UConn's number? And, like, are they just the best team in this uh, conference overall? And then they just get a horrible draw in the NCAA tournament as a number two seed against Michigan State. And as soon as you know it, their season is over. And I think that's what's so interesting because UConn's ceiling, it's so high. But at the same time, they just don't bring back a lot of the same players from last year's team, as you said. So it just might take them a little bit more time to gel. And we've just seen that so many times in this sport. Yeah. And what I would say really quick, that kind of speaks to having the NBA talent, right? Is UConn is the bad draw. I mean, UConn was a four seed last year and they beat a two seed in Gonzaga. And, you know, I can't even remember who else they beat in the tournament. I think Miami was a three or a four seed, whatever. But the point I'm trying to make is because they have that huge NBA size, upside talent, whatever, they become the bad draw where Marquette they're going to win a lot of regular season games because they are going to hit the ground running. They're not going to miss a beat from last year. They're going to probably steam through through their uh, out of conference, although I know they're playing in the Maui Invitational, which is stacked this year. But the point I'm trying to make is, but then you get to the tournament and the right team can beat a Marquette, whereas, you know, it's it's a cliche, but, you know, come tournament time, you, all, you, you want to bet on that upside and that talent because in a single elimination game, you can match up a lot of different ways, do stuff like that. So I mentioned the AP poll just came out about an hour ago, and we have three Big East teams in the top 10. You have Marquette at five, UConn at six, and Creighton at eight. But those are not the only three Big East teams to be ranked in this AP top 25. We have one more, and that is Villanova coming in at number uh, 22. And AT, this is one of the most fascinating teams to me in not only the Big East, but the entire country entering the season. Because here's the deal, right? I actually thought Kyle Neptune did a great job at Fordham. Uh, That school isn't too far away from me, and they have not won a ton historically, but really his one and only year there was the best Ford in basketball has ever looked that I've seen. But then he leaves, and Keith Ergo takes over, and they get even better last year. They, They got even closer to making the NCAA tournament. And more importantly, Villanova really struggled. Now, I know last year, despite the high expectations, they had a lot of injuries coming out of the gate. Cam Whitmore didn't even play to start the season. And uh, Justin Moore, we know, uh, knew everything that was going on with him. But I just have a very tough time going into this season and saying, you know what, Villanova, they just added a ton of quality transfers and that's all they really needed. And all of a sudden they should go back to being ranked. They should go back to competing at the top of the Big East. I just don't fall into that category. And I know they played better uh, towards the back end of last season when Justin Moore came back and when they were really healthy. And I like Tyler Burton from Rhode Island a lot. I think he was one of the better transfers available in the off season. But my point is, I just don't think it's as simple as to say, you know what, all of a sudden Villanova's healthy. All of a sudden they added a lot more quality transfers and they're just going to go back to being Villanova. I just need to see it before I believe it. I'm with you. I think you can argue not just in this conference, but maybe in all of college, but they're one of the more interesting teams. And like, again, you talk about the off season feels short, but sometimes it feels long. Like you forget about everybody. They, they, they added, you know, Tyler Burton from Richmond, you just mentioned um, TJ Bomba is really good. Uh, Lance Ware, our buddy from Kentucky, you know, who could forget him. And then I miss, Oh, Hakeem Hart, who I thought was pretty good at Maryland. So the talent is there. there. There's really two things, and I'm with you. I'm I'm a little bit more of a skeptic than pretty much, you know, I would say most people is talent is there, top 20 talent, no doubt. But one, 
I don't really get how all the pieces are supposed to fit because Eric Dixon's kind of your center, but he's like six, seven, but then you got two or three other guys that are like six, seven, six, eight, six, nine. Um, and then two, like, I also just think, well, it, it, well, really three things, the, the Villanova system, it's supposedly in theory, the way they were doing things before K- K- Kyle Neptune, um, it, it supposedly takes some time to kind of get comfortable in that system, whatever. But I, th- I, the other thing I was thinking about, usually when you bring in a bunch of transfers, it means that a bunch of guys have left the program. Now Villanova had some guys graduate Brandon Slater. They had, uh, you know, Caleb Daniels. But they also brought back a lot of guys, right? Like I think Mark Anderson or Mark Anderson, Mark Armstrong kind of thought he was the starting point guard going into this year. Now they have TJ Bamba, like, um, you know, Jordan Longino, who I thought was good two years ago, but dealt with injuries last year. He's back in the program, but they kind of recruited over him. And so it's not to say like they took the wrong approach or the players aren't good, but you add in Kyle Neptune didn't really show me much last year. Um, and then on top of that, you look at the talent being there, but how does it fit? But then also how does that locker room and it's maybe, maybe there's a perfect answer and we just don't know it yet because the talent is there. But I guess that's my big thing is I don't love how all of the pieces fit. And I also just kind of question, like, how do you feel if you're one of those guys that was kind of recruited one or two or three cycles ago and I'm coming to this developmental program and, you know, by year two, I'm going to have this. And then it's just like, boom, there's a fifth year, 23 year old senior standing in my way to playing time, you know? Definitely. And I think a lot of times we ask ourselves, like, what is the prototypical roster you want to build? And the easy answer is, oh, you want a great mix of transfers, a great mix of guys that were already in the program. But I agree. Longino is definitely a name that comes to mind. Armstrong as well. Guys that maybe one or two years ago, we thought, okay, eventually these guys are going to be really good players. And the reason why we said eventually was because we were so used to Jay Wright and the way that he ran his program of guys coming in as freshmen and really doing a good job of teaching them the game of basketball to improve their skill sets. And then by the time they're a junior and senior, that's when they blossom. Virginia in the ACC is kind of the same way, but now all of a sudden, I don't want to like, they became a bag school. Like I did not expect Villanova to all of a sudden just be so active in the transfer portal. I remember when they added Lance Ware, that came as a surprise. Like they already had three really good transfers and he definitely got some good NIL money there. Like, because they had it to spend and I guess last year was just so damaging to their fan base that they said you know what like never again we never want that to happen and we're just going to go all out and try to add talent but with guys like Dixon like Justin Moore Armstrong Longino that were already in the program I have no idea how that dynamic works especially with a coach that is still super unproven yeah and I think part of that recruiting philosophy probably comes from the fact that I think Kyle Neptune is probably feeling a little bit of heat. You know, I, I I think, you know, heat is relative. Like, I don't think he's going to get fired if they miss the NCAA tournament, but it's like, you've had this sustained level of success. Jay Wright literally made the final four in his last year. So it's not as though like, Oh, you know, well, the program was sort of on the, no, they were operating at the highest level imaginable and you take over. And, and like you said, like, I know there was injuries, but they lost to Portland last year in the out of conference. Like they lost games that you should never lose as Villanova, regardless of injury. Um, and so I, I think he felt a little uh, pressure to kind of, um, you know, kind of infuse that program with talent, but it, it was kind of jarring just to see them for so many years. We know what the cliches are and I don't want to like oversell the cliches, but it was a program where you came, you developed, you took your time uh, guys, red shirted, um, all that stuff. And now all of a sudden you look up and like I said, you just go out and get four or five guys that, that are brought in as plug and play guys. And, and, you know, they're all going to be gone next year too. And so then that becomes a separate, you know, kind of thing. And, and by the way, maybe that's a positive, right. Is because this was a program that was about development. So now maybe it is a little bit of a positive that Mark, uh, Mark Armstrong, I don't know why is Mark Anderson. That's the, the, the tight end, right. Or no, that's Mark Andrews. Yeah. Um, I keep wanting to call him. Obviously, Ma- you know. I, 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 yeah, I don't know who Mark Anderson is, but um, I keep wanting to call Mark Armstrong, Mark Anderson. So anyway, but maybe maybe it is a positive for a guy like that, where maybe now the pressure isn't on you. But I could also see the scenario where the older guys get the playing time, the younger guys get mad, they bounce in the offseason. Now, all of a sudden, you got to replace your whole roster next year. So listen, there's no perfect answer. And the one thing I will say, like the talent is there, no doubt about it. Um, it's just, to me, it's like, I, like you said, I kind of got to see it, uh, to believe it. By the way, Tyler Burton is really good. Like I, I remember even 
two, three, four years ago watching him. Like that's the kind of guy that I think like, I, I think it was kind of probably known that he was going to Nova, but that guy could be, could play at any program in the country. I think Bamba's really good. So the talent is certainly there, but again, it's about p- puzzle pieces, fit, stuff like that. Yeah. Plus Dixon, I, I really like it. And, you know, Justin Moore, he's still around and we all know what he's done at this level. And by the way, I, I just looked at it. So last year, Villanova entered the season uh, ranked as the number 16 team in the country. They lost. This is five of their first seven games, including losses at Temple and to Portland in the PK uh, 85. And then even during Big East play, they lost. They had a two game stretch in mid-January. They lost to DePaul and Butler back to back game. That's not good. <laughs> not pretty. So the other very polarizing and uh, well-covered team in this Big East conference that we have to hit on, they were not included in the AP Top 25. They came in at number 29, and that's pretty shame, interesting, shame. is St. John's. And first of all, man, I, got, I have to say, like, I, I got to give you credit, man, because it really did feel like you were the first one, I, I believe it was like a month or two into the season last year, really just saying like, man, St. John's, they haven't been relevant in way too long. They haven't won an NCAA tournament game in over two decades. What better program is there to say, you know what? We got to go all, go all in and hire Rick Patino. And of course, just a couple months later, they did. Let, and here let me are. take my victory lap here. No, it was, I vividly remember it was like early Jan. So like the whole thing with Patino for years was like, after Louisville, oh, I mean, there's scandal and you can't hire him. And then Iona hires him and he's awesome there right away, obviously. And then it's like, yeah, but I mean, can you really get him at the power five? And I was watching, I, I vividly remember it was uh, it was like a Monday night, maybe a Tuesday. St. John's was playing Marquette, no disrespect intended, at that rinky-dink Carnesecca Arena, which holds like 1,200 people. It looks like a high school gym. And there's no energy, there's no buzz, there's no nothing. And by the way, and of course, in true Mike Anderson fashion, they jump out to like a, a you know, 11 point halftime lead or something. I turn off the game for a half an hour, probably go get dinner, something like that. Come back, they're down 19 or like something absurd like that. I was like, this is so Mike. And I and it just struck me. I was like, Patino is right in town, and we can't play this whole. You know, uh, you know, uh, I mean, he broke the rule like the rules don't exist anymore. Like, can we stop pretending that that stuff matters? And so it just hit me. And that was the day that was the day it was born. I was like, if they're not going to go after Rick Pitino, they absolutely, uh, you know, they should shut down the program. And I I will say quickly, I give credit to them because I I can tell you because of my very public stance, I had, um, you know, I don't want to like brag, but I had like high level people reaching out to me like. All along, like, is this going to happen? Is it not going to happen? And there was a big stretch where it was like, this is not going to happen. They will not hire them, you know, whatever, for whatever reason. And I think they realized probably about late February, early March, as they knew that the season was, by the way, they were going to just going to bring back Mike Anderson. It wasn't even like, are we going to fire Mike Anderson? And who are we going to go get? They, I think as of probably easily February 20th, 25th, it was like, even if we fire Mike Anderson, it's not even an option. And in a span of like one week, somebody at that school realized, and I, I the, the president has a background, uh, I think at Providence and, and, you know, he kind of saw the ascension of them under Ed Cooley. But the point I'm trying to make is the administration just drew the line in the sand. was like, we're tired of being irrelevant. And this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, right? Like this is something that will never happen under any other circumstances, a hall of fame established coach, coaching in our city he doesn't even have to move and the other thing too really quick like and patino said this publicly so it's not even like a big secret he's 70 years old and there's only two places he wants to live he either wants to live in south florida or he wants to live in new york and so you know he wants to be there this isn't a stepping stone and even if it's only four five six years it's like If you're ever going to be irrelevant, do it. And so they did it. You know, there's so much buzz. I mean, you live in New York. You're wearing the Jets hat as I almost knock over my studio here. You know, you're wearing the Jets hat. But, like, I don't want to, like, oversell it because it's football season. You know, baseball season just ended. Everybody's mad at Aaron Boone and and Brian Cashman. But, like, can you feel a little bit of, like, people are at least intrigued by what's going on with St. John's? Absolutely. It's funny. Um. My dad and, and I were, were were big listeners of the Boomer and Geo show. Of course, a great radio show 
that airs uh, every morning on CBS Sports Network. And they had Patino on and they had a whole conversation about St. John's and uh, what they're going to be doing this year. And I never remember a St. John's sure. coach, especially in early October, coming on hmm. that big of a, of a platform and talking. Like, the program, they haven't even played a game yet under Patino, and the program already feels more relevant than it ever has. And I could only imagine what that's going to be like when they start winning, like we all expect them to do. And uh, I think you made some great points there. Uh, Reverend Brian Shanley is the guy's name, coming from Providence. He saw, like you said, what they did with Ed Cooley and it's about time they actually started prioritizing winning there at St. John's. And in that interview, it's crazy. Like, I don't think this comes as a surprise to many of us, but Patino said that last year, those players, they, they, they just didn't care. Like they didn't, they didn't go to class. They didn't prioritize basketball. And that's why he really, aside from Joel Soriano, oh. just a brand new ship, a clean slate when it comes to that roster coming in this year. Well, really quick before we get to new players, first of all, I love the one thing I love about like NIL in this era is like, we don't have to pretend stuff anymore. So like Patino just coming out and basically saying like, not only are these guys got not good enough, they don't care. Like he basically said at his first press conference, he's like Joel Soriano. Now that's a guy you can build your program around. And I think he was asked, or he basically referenced outside of Joel Soriano. I don't know if any of these guys are going to be back and like no disrespect, but Hey, this is the world we live in. It's 2023. You get a scholarship, you get NIL, you got to either perform or you got to get out. So I love that about this era. Um, and then too, like, yeah, I know we can get into the raw, but he did an unbelievable job. Like, and by the way, that was another one, almost like what we talked about with Dan Hurley earlier of, you know, Dan Hurley, can he win in the tournament? Can he not? Like there was a two or three week stretch where Patino didn't get some guys that the fans thought they were going to get. And it was like, oh no, did, did he lose his fastball? And it's like, now you look up, that is a top 25 roster. That is a very talented team. I think they should have been in the top 25. They were in my top 25 uh, and excited to kind of talk about what, what they're capable of this year. Yeah, I definitely would have had them over Villanova uh, right on the fringe of that top 25. I, I definitely think there's a reasonable case, and I would have them fourth in the Big East behind the, that uh, top three that we mentioned earlier, UConn, Creighton, and Marquette. But I think it's interesting, right? Like St. John's, Last year, they had a lot of talent. They just didn't execute properly, and they didn't really have the coach to put them over the top. But then when you compare this roster to last year, you'll probably say that last year's roster was more talented, but the coaching advantage that you have with Rick Patino running things is so big that we all know that the St. John's team, at the very worst, is going to be significantly better than anything we've seen recently. Yeah, I, I mean, I love you. I, I will disagree i think this roster is more talented i mean first of all and by the way it's not like like i think jordan dingle is better than any guard they had and by the way some of the guards they had are good they're still in the big east i mean uh you know owusu uh you know is at uh st john's and uh i'm blanking on the kid's name that went, ended up at butler who what was that pasha alexander Posh Alexander's at Butler, Owusu's at Seton Hall. I think I said that he's at St. John's. So it's not as though the talent was terrible, but I, I do think, you know, Jordan Dingle's probably, in my opinion, better than any guard they had. And, you know, Simeon Wilcher's the highest rated recruit they've had in forever. So I think I, I think they are more talented, but I, I think they're going to be a really good team. Now, they, like UConn, have a little bit of preseason injury stuff. You know, RJ Luis is out for a little bit. That was a guy that I actually, first of all, I I, I just liked him but I saw him kind of showing up on some of those mock draft boards as like a second roundish kind of guy to watch. So that's something to watch out for with that team. But I think when you start with Dingle and Soriano guard front court, I think that's a great, great, great place to start. And then you're starting with a hall of famer and, you know, we can argue, you know, where he is, but he's in the short conversation of best coaches in college basketball. And so you have those guys, Jenkins comes with, with them from, from Iona. I think that's another thing too, having two, three guys that kind of get what he's about and how he runs things. But I, again, just, uh, uh, you know, I know I said Villanova is like the most intriguing team in college basketball, but I think St. John's is absolutely in that short conversation as well. Yeah, and I think it's a very well-built team. Like, regardless of talent level, like, you could see that they, they're going to fit very well together. And I think it's a good point you brought up, too, about, like, early in the offseason, there was some concern. When they missed uh, on the kid from Iona who uh, ended up going to Florida, Walter Clayton, yeah, the reigning MAC player of the year. Like, a lot of people thought, like, man, that's a big loss. Are they going to be able to recover? But then they – uh, counter with like later in the offseason they add Chris Ledlam who originally committed mm -hmm. to Tennessee and then he just he decided to go to St. John's but 
I think overall the theme of this team is just, man, it's been so long since they've been good. And when you bring in a coach like Patino, Mm -hmm. at the very worst, you know you're going to get back to relevance. And I'm just really looking forward to watching this team and this program and Rick Patino in general just playing in big games because I know he had some really good moments at Iona the last two years, but it's been about six, seven years now that we've seen Rick Patino in his heyday at Louisville at the top of the college basketball world. Like, I'm just so excited to see him playing against UConn playing against Villanova and some of the other best teams in this conference, you know, at Madison Square Garden, it's going to be must-see TV, and uh, I can't wait. No, and I, I, you know, we've, something you and I have talked about and something I've certainly talked about on my show, just the relevance that it's going to bring to college basketball to have major, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that people realize, like, I think New York, I always said this, and I've said it on my show, you know, my, my buddy, John Jastrzemski, you know him uh, from The Ringer, is, you know, New York City almost reminds me of like SEC football from this perspective or SEC teams from this perspective is people say, oh, you know, Tennessee, they're a football school or Alabama. No, I mean, we've seen what Nate Oates has done at Coleman Coliseum. We've seen Tennessee become the number one baseball program in the country, and that's one of the toughest places to play. I bring it up because the SEC isn't a football school, a basketball school or this or that. It's a if we do it, we want to compete at the highest level and we're going to throw ourselves behind it. And that's how I feel about New York city is like, yeah, they haven't talked much college basketball because St. John's hasn't given them a reason to talk college basketball. And so I do think with them being back to kind well, they're not back yet, but I think they will get there. I think they're going to be a tournament team this year. It's incredible. What's the stat. I mean, they haven't won a tournament game since the year 2000, which is insane to think about. Um, again, it's going to take a little time, but I think they get there. Um, and I'm really excited to watch this team. Yeah. Looking at their schedule right now, Rick Pitino's first game at Madison square garden. It's going to be November 13th against Michigan, Michigan, right? Which is going to be a great game. Must see TV. Well, AT, we've spoken a lot of big East hoops before we get out of here. Any last thoughts on this conference? One quick thought uh, I'll throw at you. Or I guess a couple. One would be, I-, I think Providence is kind of the underrated under the radar right. team. I really like their talent. I thought what Bryce Hopkins was able to do last year, coming over to Kentucky and immediately right away, just taking the reins and saying, you know what, I'm going to be this team's go-to scorer. Anytime we need a bucket, I'm going to be able to get it. That was really impressive, especially when he couldn't even get off the bench at Kentucky. And also Devin Carter, he's one of the best defenders in the country. And I think those two guys being on the same team is going to be a great place for Kim English to start. It's almost like one of those situations where, if Ed Cooley was coaching this team, I would probably have them in the top 25. But because mm-hmm. that new coach is just such a big question mark, you don't really know what to expect. But kind of like Villanova, I like the talent overall. And I honestly might even like the talent even a little bit more considering you have a couple of those established guys in Hopkins and Carter. I'll give Kimming his credit. I was a little hesitant on the hire, 34 years old. I think maybe 36, something like that. Very young. Um, and he wasn't like great at George Mason. He was good, uh, but he did everything right in the off season. And, and, you know, one thing I always say is you can only grade a higher based on what we know at this moment. He's got a lot of games to coach, but to retain those top players. Um, and I think he was smart about it because I think there was this assumption even six, eight months ago of like, well, you know, I mean, there's just no rules on transfers. And I think he really pushed with those kids. Like, you can transfer, but you might not be eligible next year. And now we're seeing it in college football where a lot of these guys never got waivers in basketball. It's starting to come out. If you're a second time transfer and there's not a real legitimate reason, we're not giving you a waiver. And so he retained them. And it's not to say that that's the only reason, but he retained them. You know, he brought in, uh, you know, Aduru with him from George Mason, who was an all league player there. And I'll say this is like, I actually don't know much about this kid, but the Garway Duwall kid for uh, the freshman People are talking about him as like a dark horse, like he could be like a one and done type talent. So I, like I said, I give to Kim English a ton of credit. And then the one thing, the other thing I'll say is that um, it goes without saying one of the best home courts in college basketball. I've been to that place many times. I don't know what they call it now, but it's the dunk. It's the Dunkin' Donuts center. Um, And it's just a, it's a great fan base, great home court. Um, And Kim English to his credit, he's done just about everything that you could have asked for to this point. Yeah, absolutely. One last thought and uh, in the other direction, I'm starting to say we can't talk about the the current Providence without talking about the former Providence. But go ahead. No, I I was actually going to go in a different direction. I I wanted to talk about Xavier. I'm a little bit worried about this team because 
I mentioned UConn and how much production they lost from last year's team with mm-hmm. three of their best players. I don't think people realize just how much talent Xavier is losing from last year's team. You start off with maybe the best ad in the history of the transfer portal in Sue boom from UTEP. I think people were expecting him to be good. That team going into last year kind of had an obvious hole at the point guard position, but he was one of the best players in the big East and maybe even college basketball. Sean Miller. We know he's an absolute beast on the recruiting trail, but even for his standards, that was just a heck of an ad. They also will lose Jack Nungy, who was super productive. Kobe Jones, he's a first round uh, NBA draft pick. They lose Adam Kunkel as well. And while I like some of the additions they made, like a Davion McKnight from Western Kentucky, like uh, Quincy Oliveri coming in from Rice, I just don't know if that is enough to replace those guys, especially it's very important with some of the injuries they're dealing with right now to uh, Zach Fremantle and Jerome Hunter, two guys that I'm sure like going into this offseason, Sean Miller expected both those guys to be very key pieces. So I know Sean Miller is a great coach and he's one of those guys that I'll never feel confident betting against them, but I just don't love the Xavier roster right now, considering how much they lost from last year. Yeah. He, you know, he, to his credit, he did add some bigger piece, like physically big pieces uh, late in the portal, the, the kid from North Texas. And and I don't know if that's because he was a little questionable on Zach Fremantle, but I, I'm with you is I trust him as a coach. Um, but I think it, if this was, you know, the big East a few years ago, maybe I'd feel, but the league is just so good. And I I do think it's going to be a little bit of an uphill battle. And then to your point, he did inherit a lot of, of talent just from a year ago. So um, I trust him. And I, and I do like the piece. I think McKnight's going to be really good for them. I think Oliveri is going to be really good for them, but again, you know, Zach Fremantle is a really important piece to what they do and to not have him. And I know they didn't have him for the back half of last year, but I think that's just a really, really, really tough ask for them. Uh, like them, trust Coach Miller, but I think that's going to be a tough uphill battle for them. All right. We've spoken a lot of Big East basketball here today, AT. Before we get out of here, I know you uh, briefly mentioned, uh, you know, Providence's former coach, Ed Cooley. Yeah. What are your expectations for Georgetown this year? And, and what would you consider a successful season for them? No, I mean, that's that to me is a more interesting one, right? Because there was so there was so much that went into that hire and the conversation and Providence fans and, you know, Dave Portnoy got involved and like, it was like a big thing. It was, you know, it marches outside of college basketball. There's not a lot going on. That became like a real thing. And then when everybody kind of left the college basketball kind of consciousness, like I kind of felt like it was like a C plus kind of summer for it. Cool. Like I think Kim English unquestionably had a better summer. Like, like, again, you go back to what I said about Kim English earlier. I just assumed that part of Ed Cooley going to Providence, he's going to bring Bryce Hopkins and he's going to bring Dev, uh, uh, Carter and a couple of his guys and whatever. And that did not happen. Now, again, maybe it was because Kim English sold them on. You might not be eligible, et cetera. But I bring it up to say, you know, you look at that team and I sort of like some of the pieces, but I, I just thought for all the excitement around the hire. And and the other thing too, is like, you kind the buzz had been there for quite some time that like he was the candidate. He's probably going to be the guy. And so you just expect when it actually happens, that big stuff is going to happen. And like, I mean, they got a visit from Hunter Dickinson and, but I mean, you know, is Dontrez style. Like, I don't like, I guess Jaden Epps. I do like Jaden Epps, the, the point guard they got from Illinois, but outside of, I, I don't know. I just, I'm not super excited. And again, it's not a one year commitment. It's a, you know, six, seven, eight year contract or whatever it ended up being. I forget, but like, you know, he's going to have time to do it his way. And, you know, it was never about, super splashy stuff but you go back to last year providence the entire roster was essentially transfers that were built out after that uh big east championship team two seasons ago so i thought he would have a little bit more success he didn't um i don't have a good explanation as to why maybe that was never the plan all along but i did expect it to be a little bit of a splashier type summer for them uh at providence or at uh uh, make that freudian slip a few times talking to Kalia at georgetown yeah, I I wonder if like the academics at Georgetown maybe have something to do with that. Like, because that was something I was definitely wondering as well. But it's not like they yeah. didn't add transfers. Like they did add some guys. I'm sure you heard about this too. It's always so hard, like whether you how much stock you put into this. But it's secret scrimmage season, of course. These last few days with uh, the season coming up in a couple of weeks, and uh, our guy John Fanna tweeted this a couple of days ago. Georgetown beat Wake Forest in a secret scrimmage in D.C. this afternoon, mm. 80 77 Illinois transfer Jaden Epps scored 46 points to, lead to the victory. He shot 
15 of 24 from the field and six of 11 from three with four assists as well. I really liked him at Illinois last year, but it was clear that for some reason or another, Brad Underwood just didn't necessarily always trust him, especially in the biggest moments with the game on the line. But uh, even in a secret scrimmage, those are pretty impressive numbers. 46. Okay. I mean, Wake Forest plays a little fast, so maybe it was an up-tempo game, but no, I did not. I actually did not see that. I love Fanta. I follow him, so I'm a little surprised I didn't see that, but uh, no, I mean, I think, you know, to me, he was the guy, like of all the players that they got, he was the best player, but again, it kind of goes to what we've been talking about is if he's the best player in a league where you're going up against UConn, Creighton and Marquette, we really didn't even talk that much about, like, like you talk about St. I don't know. I just, I, I guess, I guess I, like I said, I was expecting a little bit more, but again, you know, he had a pretty high level of success at Providence. And so if he says that he's got a plan, I guess I should probably trust him. All right. One last thought to leave you guys with before we get out of here on the biggies preview pod, you mentioned it, right? We hadn't spoken too much in detail about Creighton and Marquette. And I have a Creighton take that I'll run by you guys. And uh, maybe we could hit on this either today or, or later down the line. I love the way this team fits, and I know there are going to be yes. plenty of questions and plenty of concerns about they lose Ryan Nempart, they lose Arthur Kaluma. Those are two of their better players from last year's team. And I'm here to tell you that Creighton played really good basketball two years ago after Ryan Nembhardt went down in the middle of February, I believe it was, with a, a broken uh, arm. He had an arm injury, and they played really good. They went to the round of 32 that year, and they were very close to beating the team that ultimately won the national championship in Kansas. And I just felt like at times last year, there was something off. I know that there was a ton of hype, a ton of expectations going into the season. We see this a lot in college sports where at times just you have players that are a little bit more focused on them and their NBA future opposed to the team and just winning games. And I just feel like with Greg McDermott and his ability to keep Calc Brunner, to keep Trey Alexander, to keep Baylor Shireman, and then they add a transfer in Steven Ashworth from Utah State that just fits their team perfectly in the style they want to play. I'm also really high on a Mason Miller going into his sophomore year. I think he's going to be in for a bigger role. Fred King, Farabello, like there's just, there's just so much continuity on this team. I love the way they fit. And if you ask me, Zach, like, who should be the favorite in your eyes, I would look at Creighton going into the season. I, I mean, I like him a lot. And, you know, last year it was weird. And listen, I mean, you know, Kaluma and Nemhar transferring, I think it speaks to they, I mean, I know this, they they felt like they should have had a bigger role. They should have been used a different way. And, you know, we'll find out who was right and who was wrong. You know, Nemhard's going to have the ball in his, I mean, he had the ball in his hands at Creighton. So like, I don't, I, you know, but he's at Gonzaga. His brother had success there. Maybe it's the same thing 2.0 and Kaluma, I think found a good spot uh, at Kansas state, but I'm with you. Is cause I, cause I, what I think is when you have a season where you have success, but there's clearly, it, it felt like there was certainly something going on behind the scenes. And, by the way, I get it. Kalkbrenner had, you know, mono or whatever was sick and whatever. The point I'm trying to make is that like, it felt like there was something not quite right for most of the year. They get hot, go to the elite eight, but I bring it up because when you have guys leave off a successful team, um, probably means that they didn't want to be there. Or there was something they weren't happy about, but then you also have guys that come back, which means that it wasn't like a totally toxic, you know, messed up thing. And then I think the other thing is besides the fact that all the pieces fit, it's clear that if 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 other guys are leaving and you're coming back, it means that you're bought into what the the process is and what it looks like. And so, um, I you know I don't know that I have like it, you know I know this is a preview pod and we're supposed to make our picks and all. I don't know that I have like a super strong opinion on who should be number one. I think Marquette probably should be number one, uh, but as far as who's going to win it, I think it could be any of those top three. And if it was Creighton, it would not surprise me at all. All right, AT. Always fun doing this. So happy to have college basketball back and to be talking about it on this show. We're going to be doing this throughout the next few weeks leading into the season, talking about a ton of the other conferences around the sport. But the Big East, there are, are so many eyes on this conference, so many intriguing storylines going into this conference, going into this season, and uh, had a great time talking about it. I appreciate you, Zach. We'll do it again uh, later in the week with, uh, I think we'll do the SEC next. I think that's the plan. So, Absolutely. Thank you guys for listening. That was the Big East.